can't believe I have to follow Casey Neistat on stage. This is very unfair, especially because uh, when Casey, Casey texted me at 5 a.m. yesterday and he said, hey, do you want to come filming with me? I did not know I would be filming the act that would then upstage me. <laughs> um, but I'm not worried because I have an exciting lecture for you on an ancient school of an obscure uh, sorry, uh, uh, an obscure lecture on, a, on an ancient school of philosophy, so it's going to be super exciting, um, and, I, and I know you're all very ready for it. Um, look, that's not the kind of philosophy that, that, that I'm interested in. I'm interested in the philosophy as, as Thoreau defines it. He says, to be a philosopher is not merely to have subtle thoughts nor even to found a school. It is to solve some of the, the problems of life, not only theoretically, but practically. And Epicurus says, vain is the word of the philosopher which does not heal the suffering of man. And then Seneca, who, who we're going to talk a little bit about today, is saying, of all the people, only those are at leisure who make time for philosophy and only they truly live because they, they, they benefit from the wisdom of all of humanity, of all of history. And this, the kind of philosophy that I want to talk to you about, the stoicism that we're going to talk about today, is, is a philosophy used by doers, right? You have Pete Carroll, who's a Super Bowl winning coach of the Seattle Seahawks. You've got George Washington, who was introduced to stoicism at, at 16 years old by a neighbor. You've got Eugene Delacroix, who's a, a French romantic painter, most famous for liberty leading the people. You've got Ambrose Bierce, who's a famous uh, American satirist, a uh, contemporary of Mark Twain, actually a, a veteran of the U.S. Civil War. You've got Thomas Wentworth Higginson, also in the U.S. Civil War. He's the first white leader of black troops in the Civil War. He translates Epictetus while he's at Harvard, who's another Stoic. You have Beatrice Webb, who's a social activist. She invents the concept of collective bargaining. You've got Bill Belichick, who's also a Super Bowl winning coach. Uh, this. Uh, of the New England Patriots. In fact, he read my book, and only after he beat the Seattle Seahawks in the Super Bowl did the Seahawks uh, bother to read it. Um, you've got James Stockdale, who's the highest ranking U.S. pilot shot down over Vietnam. He spent seven years in a, in a terrible prison camp. As he's parachuting down into this prison, he, he says to himself, I am leaving the world of technology and entering the world of Epictetus, who he'd studied in college. Um, Michelle Trafoya, who's a, is an American broadcaster, she covers the Olympics, she covers Sunday Night Football, she's a practitioner of Stoicism. And then Bill Clinton actually rereads Marcus Aurelius every single year and has since, <clears throat> since he was the president. And, and so this is philosophy for doers. This is philosophy Marcus Aurelius is, is the most powerful man in the world in his own time. He's the emperor of Rome. And every night he practices Stoic philosophy. He sits down and he writes notes to himself about how to be a better person. And that that work survives to us in a, in, a, in, a, in a book called Meditations. And I was introduced to Meditations. I was about 19 years old. This is right before I dropped out of college. I had to buy it on Amazon. As you can see here, this is, uh, oh, it's not working. Long before the days of Amazon Prime, I had to buy a few other books and, and wait several days for it to arrive. And as I did, um, I tore this book apart. It's what the economist Tyler Cowen would call a quake book. It shakes everything that I think that I know about the world. Now, admittedly, I'm 19 years old, so it's not a whole hell of a lot, but, but it, shakes, it shakes everything to, 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 to the core for me. And, and really, it's a, actually, this is a picture of me reading meditations. After the next web conference uh, here in 2013, I went to Rome. Um, this is me on, on the Appian Way, where Marcus would have come to and from the city. And, and really, it's though, it's, it's a single passage in this book that has the most resonance for me, and I'll, I'll show that to you now. He's saying, um, our actions may be impeded, but there can be no impeding our intentions or dispositions because we can accommodate and adapt. The mind adapts and converts to its own purposes, uh, the obstacle to our acting. And then he concludes with the, the maxim that I've tried to live my life by. He says, the impediment to action advances action. What stands in the way becomes the way. And so this is the critical tenet of Stoicism, essentially in any and every situation, no matter how bad or seemingly undesirable it is, we have the opportunity to practice a virtue. And, and virtue is a, a bit loaded, so we'll replace that with excellence. Everything that happens to us is a chance to practice excellence. And 
This is, I think, best illustrated by a quote from, from Andy Grove, who's one of the CEOs of Intel. He's saying, bad companies are destroyed by crisis, good companies survive them, great companies are improved by them. The Stoics say over and over again, we don't control what happens to us, we control how we respond. And so we can always respond well, we can always respond with excellence, and we can turn this obstacle into an opportunity. And that's, that's what I ultimately sat down and wrote a book about. That's how I've tried to approach my entrepreneurial ventures. That's how I try to approach my writing as a, as as a person who wakes up every day and struggles to try to be better at something. And so um, what I thought I would do is I'd walk you through sort of three disciplines of stoicism, three, uh, some stories along the way, three uh, critical parts of, of sort of mindset, action, and willpower that can allow you to apply this, what, what Andy Grove is talking about in your own life. And the, the first discipline is the discipline of perception. That's how we look at what we face, right? And oftentimes, unfortunately, the way we respond to something makes it worse. We tell ourselves that something is unfair. We tell ourselves that we're screwed over. We tell ourselves that this is the worst thing that ever happened. And um, <clears throat> great people don't do this, right? Um, when the, when the United States was launching the Apollo program, what they actually looked for in the astronauts was not their ability to pilot, although they, they hired some of the, the greatest uh, test pilots from, from the Air Force, but what they really looked for was their ability to regulate their emotions in stressful situations. And they, would tra they trained this skill to its apex. So over and over again, the astronauts were exposed to stressful situations. Uh, they were gradually exposed over time to everything they would potentially face in space. So when an astronaut not like John Glenn orbits uh, the, the planet Earth for, for more than a day, his heart rate actually never goes over 100 beats per minute. Meanwhile, most of us, you know, we get an angry phone call or an unpleasant email, we, we start to feel that pounding on our chest because we haven't practiced that. And, and it's so dangerous, especially for an astronaut, not to practice that because uh, Without that meticulous preparation, if something goes wrong, you're really screwed over. You can, as Chris Hadfield, who's a Canadian astronaut, uh, said a few years ago, he's saying, look, um, it's worth remembering that there's no problem so bad that you can't make it worse also. And that's oftentimes what our perceptions do. We make a bad thing even worse, and then we complain that it's too hard to get over. And so I'm, I'm particularly inspired by people who don't do this. So um, as, as Epictetus says, you know, who then is invincible? The one who cannot be upset by anything outside his reason choice. And John D. Rockefeller, right, as a young man, uh, he starts in finance. A few years later, the panic of 1857 strikes. And it's one of the, 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 the worst economic crises in American history. It actually originates in Ohio where he's based. But, but what Rockefeller does is he sees this as an opportunity, an opportunity to study the market, to see what people do in extreme situations, and to learn from it. And he, he ultimately, he calls this his apprenticeship. He says, I'm, I'm, how blessed are those who struggle for a foundation or a beginning in life. And he's actually grateful that this happened. And, and in fact, he makes a significant part of his fortune in the next economic crises because he trained in that one. So the Panic of 1873, uh, the Panic of 1907, even as an old man in 1929, when the market goes south, he makes a fortune again because he'd had this apprenticeship in difficulty. And so that's just a, a, a slight tweak on how to look at a difficult thing, turns it into uh, a benefit rather rather than an obligation that we have to go through. And as Seneca says, a good person dies events with his own color and turns whatever happens to his own benefit. And then that leads to the, the next discipline of Stoicism, which would be the discipline of action, right? Stoicism is not the secret. It's not magically wishing that something is, is true. Uh, there is no power of intention. If you want to make a million dollars, you will not suddenly make a million dollars. You have to do something about it, right? So what do you do? How do you, how do you guard your perceptions, but then take action by them. And so Dwight D. Eisenhower, I think, is a wonderful example of this. As, as, as the Nazis overwhelmed Europe with, with, with the Blitzkrieg, which was a, a, a fundamental change in the, in, in the in modern warfare. And, and the Blitzkrieg attack is actually designed to exploit the flinch of the enemy. The idea is if you, if you throw enough firepower and you throw enough speed at an enemy, they will break, that you will be able to plunge into their territory and they won't be able to catch up, right? This is essentially how the Blitzkrieg attack works. So as the, as the German panzer divisions uh, wreaked havoc through Europe, this, 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 uh, this exploitation was, w became sort of a feedback loop. And, um, Shortly after the invasion of Normandy, uh, 
the Nazis uh, launched what is the largest sort of counteroffensive uh, that they'd ever done. It was about 200,000 troops. They're being launched at the Allies, and the Allies really have nowhere to go, right? They can't get back on their boats and go home. And so for the first real time, Eisenhower is forced to examine this strategy. He's forced to examine why the Blitzkrieg is working. And he assembles all his generals at, a, at, the, at the Allied headquarters in Malta, and it's this magnificent scene. He's, he strolls into the conference room. All his generals are, are, are sitting around the table, and he says, the present situation is to be regarded as opportunity for us and not disaster. There will be only cheerful faces at this conference table. And again, this isn't just his perception. This isn't just how he's looking at it. But what he's realized is that if the Allies could bend instead of break, if they could if they could allow the enemy advance to happen, but then encircle it from the rear, they, they could exploit a fundamental opportunity, or I guess you could say fatal flaw in the plan or, or in the effectiveness of the Blitzkrieg, in that because it relies on, the, on your lack of discipline and perception, if you, if you counteract that, all of a sudden it forces them, it, it essentially means that the Blitzkrieg is, is, is heading headfirst into a trap. And so that's what the Allies do, first at the Follies Pocket and then later at the Battle of the Bulge. These are critical victories. What looked like an overwhelming counteroffensive becomes the two of the major victories that assure Ally uh, success in Europe. They open up the path to Berlin. And so, so it's, it's how Eisenhower is able to look at this opportunity that, and then do something about it that creates, that creates the advantage from the obstacle, right? And Epictetus is saying every event has two handles, one by which it can be carried and one by which it can't. If your brother does you wrong, don't grab it by his wrongdoing, but use the other handle. And that's what Eisenhower did. He grabs it by the other handle and suddenly this, this uh, adversity becomes an advantage. And Amelia Earhart is a, a similar figure who I find deeply inspiring. Um, her strategy, uh, as she had uh, painted on the side of her plane, always think with your stick forward. There needs to be momentum. And when you slow down, especially in the air, this is where you lead to a crash. And, and uh, Amelia Earhart's sort of, I think, biggest, uh, sort of biggest and most admirable decision was as a young woman, she's in the, it's the 1920s, uh, women had just earned the right to vote. Um, she couldn't make it as an aviator, uh, as an aviatrix. This is the, an awesome word for female aviators. Um, she, she's, uh, she's working as a, as a social worker and she gets a call and, and uh, a donor had been willing to fund a, a transatlantic flight with a woman and this would be a, a record setting flight. But there was a catch, right? The catch is uh, a Amelia is not going to be able to fly the plane. She's not even going to be the co-pilot. She has to sit in the back with the map. She can be the navigator. Um, and not only that, the other two pilots are going to get paid and she's not. She basically has to sit there. As she, as she says on the flight, I was basically uh, about as helpful as a sack of potatoes. But so, so when you get that offer, what do you do? Your ego wants to say, no, I don't want that opportunity. It's not on my terms. It's offensive. Um, that's probably what I, what I might have done at a, at a certain point in my life. But what does Amelia Earhart do? She says, yes. And the reason she says yes is this idea of thinking with your, with your stick forward, that what, what I need is a, a, just a tiny opening to put my foot through. And so she does the flight. She becomes a celebrity despite her, her, her minor role in the thing. And about five years later, she's able, to, she's able on her own to do the, uh, the first female solo transatlantic flight um, and becomes a, a world-renowned aviator. And so it's, it's this conquering of the ego uh, it, that, that allows us to see opportunities where others might have seen uh, a, an offensive offer or, or uh, uh, something that wasn't good enough for us. And so um, Epictetus is saying, again, first tell yourself what kind of person you want to be, then do what you have to do. For nearly in every pursuit, we see this to be the case. Those in an athletic pursuit first choose the sport they want, and then they do that work. And that's what Amelia Earhart does. And that's what every young person or, or, or older people have to do uh, if they, if they want to move forward in their career. And then the, the final story I like in the discipline of action, again, it's perception plus action. Um, is this idea of remaining a student, re ma maintaining the beginner's mindset throughout the entirety of your career. And so in the early 1980s, there was a, a guitarist, his name was Kirk Hammett. He was in a, a pretty decent metal band called Exodus. Um, and then he gets a call. He's been invited to join a, a, an even better band that's really going places and that band is called Metallica. And, and what does he do shortly after getting this? This is literally, Stephen Pressfield calls this the moment when you turn pro, L literally the, Almost uh, at the exact same time that he turns pro, he gets his dream job with his dream band. 
what, is, what does Hammett do? He decides that he's actually not good enough, that he needs to be much better. So he hires a guitar teacher, and he hired a little-known musician in Berkeley named Joe Satriani, who would later go on to become himself one of the best guitarists of all time. And he attaches himself to this master to learn even more. And as Satriani later said, um, Hammett was a really good guitar player. Uh, he just hadn't learned how to play in an environment uh, where he learned all the names and how to connect everything together. So for two years, he studies under this master. Um, he does the work, as Epictetus is saying. He does the work. He turns this weakness into a sort of a lifelong fascination with his craft and becomes one of the greatest guitar players of all time. So it's, again, it's, it's the perception of, of controlling your ego, seeing the opportunity where there's difficulty, but also when things are going amazing, seeing something that remains to be done or remains to be learned. And it's this student mindset, the beginner's mindset that allows us to be humble all the way through. And as Goethe says, a great failing is to see yourself as more than you are and value yourself at less than your true worth. So I find the Earhart and the Hammett story to be two sides of the same coin in, in, in that sense. And Epictetus says, and, and I think about this on a daily basis, it is impossible for a person to learn that which he thinks he already knows. And then that finally leads us to the, the final discipline of Stoicism, which is the discipline of the will. Discipline of perception is how you look at things. Discipline of action is how you, how you act on things. And then finally, what do you do with the things that you cannot change? Um, what do you do with the, the unfortunate or incredibly difficult things that we face in life? So the story I like with this is Thomas Edison. He's, uh, he's an old man in, in the early 1900s. Uh, he, he's worked all day at his laboratory. He's built a, a, a magnificent workshop in, in New Jersey. And he sits down to dinner with his family, and a man rushes in. And he, he informs him that the factory is on fire. And so Edison, he rushes to the scene. And, and, and indeed, he finds that his life work has quite literally gone up in flames. And not only uh, gone up in flames, but because of the weird chemicals that he stored in this facility, it's this serene, surreal fire. Right? So it's, it's red and blue and green and all these strange flames. And, and, and what, what Edison says is, is something that sticks with me. He, he finds his son there. His son is sort of shell-shocked, standing there, looking at you know, basically the family's wealth um, going up in smoke. And, and Edison, he looks at him and he says, go get your mother and all her friends. They'll never see a fire like this again. Um, and he hadn't lost his mind. Um, he realized, you know, in, in, in 1907, I believe, uh, you know, a fire truck would have been uh, like a, a bucket of water pulled by a, uh, pulled by a horse and on a wagon, right? So the, the fire cannot be put out. They have to let it run its course, essentially. But, but what Edison does control is how he's going to respond to this. And, and his response isn't just uh, to laugh at it. He's not the old man laughing at, at, this, at this obscene sight. But it, but this invigorates him. As he tells a reporter the next day, I've been through a lot of things like this. It prevents a man from being inflicted with ennui. And, and what he meant was, look, I'm old and successful. I, I've lost that drive or urgency, but this gives me some purpose. I, I can use this uh, to find energy and enthusiasm. And that's, that's in, in fact, what happens. Uh, he borrows a million dollars from Henry Ford, and he rebuilds his factory, and he's up and working again in, in, in less than six weeks. And as Seneca says, anger always outlast hurt? Would anyone think it normal to return a kick to a mule or to bite a dog? And then the final story I wanted to leave you with is the story, uh, I, I call this a live time, dead time. Um, it's, a, it's advice I got from Robert Greene right before I, I, I left my, my very well-paying job to become a writer. He said, what are you going to do with this time before you leave? Is it going to be a live time or dead time for you? And uh, there's a criminal named Malcolm Little. Um, he, was a, he ran numbers. He was a pimp. He sold drugs. He, uh, he had an armed robbery ring uh, where he would burglarize houses. Um, and he finally gets caught and he's sentenced to, to about 10 years in jail. And so um, what is he going to do with this time? He's, he's got 10 years to basically sit and think. Um, well, it's in prison that Malcolm Little becomes Malcolm X, and it's because of his choice to decide between a live time and dead time. And what he does is he checks out a dictionary from the prison library, he gets a pencil and a pad of paper, and he begins word by word to transfer those word, uh, word by word, to transfer what he read in the dictionary into his notebook. And he, he teaches himself to read this way, he teaches himself to learn this way, and in fact, he spends the rest of his time learning. As he would later say, from then until I left that prison in every free moment I had, if I was not reading in the library, I was reading in my bunk. And he said he'd never been so free in his life. Um, Robert Greene says, uh, 
You know, many a thinker has been produced in prison where we have nothing to do but think. But prisons also produce a lot of criminals, right? Criminals double down on their career there because they decide that this time is wasted. And, and what the Stoic does with, with dead time in their life, whether that's being stuck in traffic or on an airplane, you know, stuck on the tarmac or, or, or someone is late to meet you or, or you're filling out a contract, it's what are you going to do with this time? What are you going to turn it into that ultimately determines whether you're going to be successful or not? Because we face a lot of dead time in life unless we choose for it not to be that. And um, Cleanthes is another Stoic. He's saying the fates guide the person who accepts them and hinder the person who resists them. And so this is Stoicism, perception, action, will. Um, and I'll leave you, if you forget everything I said in every single story, I'll, I'll leave you with one final quote from Marcus Aurelius, which I think sums this up. And it's a, it's a quote I, I try to read at least once a day. He says, objective judgment now at this very moment, that's the discipline of perception, unselfish action, now at this very moment, that's the discipline of action, willing acceptance, now at this very moment, of all external events, that is all you need. So thank you very much for having me. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.